This is the Comics Alternative Interviews, a conversation with Sarah Glidden. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Comics Alternative Interviews. I'm Derek. And I'm Andy, and we're two guys with PhDs talking about comics. And on this episode, we have the pleasure of talking with Sarah Glidden. Her new book, Rolling Blackouts, Dispatches from Turkey, Syria, and Iraq, is coming out this week from Drawn and Quarterly. But before we get into that conversation, we want to let all of you know that this episode of the Comics Alternative Interviews is brought to you by the great folks at Discount Comic Book Service. Go to their website, dcbservice.com, for all of your comics pre-ordering needs. There, you're going to find all DC, Marvel, Image, and Dark Horse titles at 40% off at the cover price if you pre-order. For all of the other publishers, you'll find that those discounts are 20 to 35% off at the cover price. And every single month, you're going to find a lot of great specials. Sometimes those specials are going to be at 45% off at the cover price, sometimes at 50% off cover. But often, you can find discounts that are more impressive than that. That's right. And since we're talking today to um, the cartoonist Sarah Glidden, you can actually pick up her earlier book, How to Understand Israel in 60 Days or Less, from DCB Service right now, at either 30 or 40 percent off, depending if you want the hardcover or the trade paperback. So, 30 percent off for the hardcover at 13.97, and 40 percent off the paperback at 11.99. Yeah, you know, you can go with either. I'd go for the hardcover, though, because <laughs> it's a great book. Definitely check that out at Discount Comic Book Service. Their website is dcbservice.com. you got to go there for all of your comics pre-ordering needs. And after you do get your copy of How to Understand Israel there, please be sure to send them an email and tell them that the two guys with PhDs sent you. That's right. Andy, this was a fun interview. Um, I really enjoy and appreciate Sarah's work. And, uh, you know, several years ago when How to Understand Israel in 60 Days or Less came out, uh, I, I, it just really hit me in, in a great way. And, and part of the reason is because I do quite a bit of work with Jewish comics, and so it fit right in to what I was working on. So I was excited to see that uh, not only is the new book – uh, rolling blackouts about to come out uh, when it was first solicited, but that how to understand Israel is going to be re-released this time through Drawn and Quarterly because it was originally a Vertigo book. Yeah, and that's right. So we get a chance to talk to Sarah about the new book, but also about uh, the republication of how to understand Israel through Drawn and Quarterly. That's right. So uh, let's go ahead and get to that conversation. Yep, let's do it. We're here today with uh, Sarah Glidden, uh, the creator behind the newly released Rolling Blackouts, Dispatches from Turkey, Syria, and Iraq, and also the newly re-released um, How to Understand Israel in 60 Days or Less, both from Drawn and Quarterly. So thanks for joining us, Sarah. Thanks for having me. Yeah, welcome to the show, Sarah. One of the questions I want to start with is kind of a, a bigger question that Rolling Blackouts raises um, since you're you're dealing with questions throughout the book about journalism. And one of the questions that I think comes up very early in the book, but also is something probably on some readers' minds, especially if they're familiar with how to understand Israel, is um, what do you see as the distinction between a memoir and journalism? Uh, I don't know if there's any like strict boundaries like a memoir includes, you know, this much talking about yourself or something like that. But for me, it was about intention. Like I went into this with the intention of making it journalism or kind of meta journalism as it might be. And with the how to understand Israel, I just kind of went into it thinking that I was doing an extension of the journal comics, which were how I kind of got into comics in the first place. You know, I really wasn't thinking of myself as a journalist and I wasn't thinking 
of the book as, yeah, a piece of reporting, especially since it was about, you know, this one of the most complex conflicts like mm-hmm. on the planet. And I was definitely not an expert. So, you know, I wasn't going into it um, with that in mind. Um, so I'm sure, you know, there are other things that kind of separate memoir from journalism. But for me, right off the bat, it was just that wasn't what I was going there to do. Um, and it was all about my own feelings and my own thoughts. And, you know, I think that that can have a place in journalism, but, you know, definitely not for, (laughs) not for that book. Uh, that was, I don't consider it journalism. Um, but it does include some elements of that, you know, you might find in journalism. Um, you know, like I did take a lot of notes and do some recording of people. Um, it has a lot of, you know, kind of researched information, but I kind of consider those books completely different from each other. Mm-hmm. It's interesting because, um, you know, when I first read How to Understand Israel in 60 Days or Less, you know, I definitely thought of it as, as as memoir, although there was some some reportage as well, right? So you're mm-hmm. doing something somewhat journalistic in that, but I hadn't thought of it in those terms until I started reading Rolling Blackouts. And, you know, as Andy pointed out, you know, in the opening pages, you do foreground this question, what is journalism? And then that got me thinking about the potential links between what you're doing in How to Understand Israel in the new book. And yeah, Rolling Blackouts is more journalistic, I guess, but there's also quite a bit of you in there. So I I think that Rolling Blackouts helped me to understand better the previous book. Hmm, interesting. And I was also thinking that if, if, if you take the memoir tone in the writing and combine it with something more journalistic as we get in Rolling Blackouts, I mean, how different is that from what we had, let's say, in the 1970s and the new journalism? Well, yeah, that's definitely um, the kind of journalism that I was thinking of. And, you know, like the new journalism of the 1970s just kind of became narrative journalism right. mm. in the 90s. And now, you know, like I, you know, started reading The New Yorker when I was in my early 20s. And that was kind of the journalism that I was the most attracted to, like long form narrative journalism. And a lot of those reporters um, were kind of just internalizing a lot of that new journalism stuff and just, you know, including themselves in their work, some more than others. Uh, I really loved um, David Foster Wallace also. Mm-hmm. And like, I think his nonfiction, you know, he really includes himself in it too. And what I like about work like that is that it kind of, it lets me trust the reporter or the writer or whoever it might be. And it kind of gives me like, I can hold their hand and go through, um, you know, the piece that they're reporting on with them in a way. And it kind of just like, you know, like I think what the new journalists were kind of making work about and thinking about was the fact of that you can't really have objectivity in journalism. There's always somebody making decisions and thinking of who you're going to talk to and which quotes of theirs you're going to use. You know, no, even if you're cr- trying to make journalism in this kind of like newsy Reuters, Reuters <laughs> <laughs> style of uh, reporting, like there's still you can't be completely objective. Um, and so I like journalism that includes the, the author because it kind of drives that point home a little bit. Like you're constantly reminded that this person is there talking to the people and this person is observing and they're the ones who are going to decide what you get to see in the end or what you get to hear. Um, so yeah. Does that answer that question? <laughs> yeah. 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 Okay. Um. Definitely. And and that that actually brings up another question because it, se- it seems like w- from what you're saying, if if this is a if this is a good paraphrase, that um, there you can't have objectivity, but what you're describing is something like authenticity. Yeah, I think that's a great way to describe it, and authenticity and transparency, I guess. Yeah. And so that that led me to another question, which I I wonder about just in terms of comics nonfiction in general are there are there ways that you as an as an artist are try to um try to self-consciously create a sense of authenticity like are there strategies for that that you might use as a as an artist hmm. i don't know i mean yeah I'm, I'm just 
trying my best to be honest with my reader um, and to kind of really show whether it's myself um, or the kind of person who's taking center stage in whatever scene, kind of show them as the person I observe them as, you know, with like their body language and, you know, the kind of the way they talk is important to me. Mm -hmm. Um, Not just what they're saying and kind of, yeah, how they're interacting with other people. And I think there's a kind of like realism that I'm going for with this. And a lot of that makes it so it's really slowed down. Like Mm -hmm. uh, I don't, actual, you know, text journalism won't be all quotations. You know, this book is really mostly dialogue and all of that dialogue is, you know, real dialogue that I recorded. And that might, you know, you might have that in a documentary, but if it were an article, the reporter would be taking what people said and paraphrasing it and using their own voice to kind of like describe what this person went through or what happened. Um, And I really like to slow things down by showing people talk and showing their conversations and like kind of how the conversation meanders a little bit and maybe like gets into a kind of tense place at times. Um, And for me, that's kind of my way of, yeah, showing people as I see them. I'm not going to say as they are because, Mm -hmm. you know, it's all subjective again, (laughs) but, you know, I'm just trying my best to, to show what I experienced. What what you just said there reminds me of a couple things you do in this book that I find really interesting. Um, one of them was, um, you, you know, you talked about a little bit there about silence and the the scenes where um, where the journalists are recording an interview and they have to do the I can't remember what it's called where they record the sound of the room for thirty seconds. Yeah, room tone. Mm-hmm. Yeah, room tone, and you have then you then have like four silent panels. Yeah. To, re- to represent that thir- those 30 seconds. And then the other thing, and this, this was a, this was a technique I found really interesting was when you have s- translation taking place and you have the overlapping word balloons. Yeah. That I thought a lot about how to do that. Right. Um, it was like a new problem that I'd never had before doing foreign languages. Um, mm-hmm. And I kind of borrowed that from, from documentaries or from kind of radio interviews where you do have an interpreter and someone speaking the original language. Um, you know, and you hear that on NPR a lot, like a person will start talking and then kind of their voice will fade out and the interpreter will come in um, and you hear what they're saying. And I kind of thought that that would be a good way to, to show the other person and their own original language and their words. But, you know, I, didn't want to, you know, I originally thought maybe I can have a whole word balloon and then the whole translation, but the effect would have been so crowded that mm-hmm. I think it would have made it harder to read the comic and would have made things less clear. Um, and so, yeah, that's kind of the solution that I came upon. So like, you know, other people had suggestions, like maybe just like a little tiny word balloon with nothing in it from the person <laughs> speaking the other language. And then I was like, no, that literally is robbing their voice. I can't do that. <laughs> and then, you know, and I also had to think like, um, you know, could I do Woodstock, Woodstock <laughs> and I was like, no, that's like horrible. So, you know, I ended up having to, you know, I hired a translator. I played them the little sections of tape of those people talking and had them, you know, just transliterate, like just basically transcribe it back into Arabic or Kurdish. And then I traced the original language. Um, there are, so that was like, that was the solution I came upon. I was, I was pretty proud of it, but it was like a problem that I thought about for a couple of weeks. I was like, I don't know what I'm going to do about this. Um, yeah. And in yeah. fact, in light of that, one of the things that really struck me was, I guess, the absence of that strategy and how effective that became after you had set up that pattern. And I'm thinking particularly of toward the end of the book. This is around, what, page 280-some, when you guys are going to, what, Duma to mm-hmm. the, for, for people to pick up their rations. Mm-hmm. And there's one uh, refugee that uh, your friend Sarah begins to talk with. And she becomes angered. And Mm -hmm. so what you do over a series of several panels is you let her speak without translation. And Mm -hmm. so for me, at least, the effect was one of 
I mean, much more intense emotional drama than you would have gotten had there been any kind of translation of any sort in those panels. Yeah, um, because, yeah, the there was a young refugee who was kind of, she volunteered to to translate for us, and she just, that woman was making her nervous because the woman was, you know, basically yelling about how she hated Americans, and this young woman, you know, was really hesitant to translate that. Like, she felt bad, and, you know, she liked us. Um, and But then the woman starts actually yelling at her and tells her, like, you know, if you're not going to tell them what I'm saying, then you should just leave. And I thought about, you know, putting that the translation of what this woman was saying, like, underneath. But, yeah, I kind of thought, like, when, I, when we were in the moment, we didn't know that what that was woman was saying. And I kind of wanted the reader to feel that way, too. And I wanted mm-hmm. someone who speaks Arabic to be able to read that and to kind of, like, they can understand her um, and they can get that. Um, and that can be, like, between them a little bit. Um, so, yeah, like... I hope that it's okay that I left people kind of in the dark because I think that what the woman was saying was important. And actually, you know, the young woman does end up kind of translating most of what she says anyway. Yeah. But yeah, I like, I liked that moment. Yeah. I wanted to just keep it private for her. Oh, I thought it was definitely effective. And also because it, I mean, not only heightened the, the emotional impact of that scene, but it creates a sense of empathy with you guys who could not understand her, right? So as a reader, I don't know what's going on. I can assume, I can guess, I can look at the expressions on the faces of the characters in those panels, but I can't read Arabic. So Mm -hmm. I I don't know what's being said here, just as you in the situation, as it was happening, weren't sure exactly what this young woman was saying either. Yeah, Yeah, I guess that is the way. I hope that... You know, you hope that it doesn't, like, create empathy with our characters, like, in lieu of creating empathy with this woman either. Um, but since the book is from our point of view, I mean, I guess that that's kind of inevitable. Um, but I don't know. This stuff is, like, you know, a lot of the book is talking about how journalism is problematic. And, like, you know, parts of this book are problematic to me. You're mm-hmm. making choices and, you know, some of those choices are going to be highlighting one person over the other. Um, but at the end of the day, like I set out to do this book with the intention of making a book about how journalists work. Um, I had no idea even where we would, we would be going before. Like mm-hmm. I had the idea to do the book first before I knew where we were going. Um, and so at the end of the day, like it wasn't my job to do a book about all about Iraqi refugees, but about the journalists and you know, in their perspective too. So yeah, I guess, I don't know, I'm going off on a tangent, but I, you know, just to say like, I worried about these things. I still do. And, you know, it's a, it's a complicated problem making this book, I guess. I I think what you're, what you're getting at here, uh, especially when we're, we're talking about a lot of these, um, these things that, that you do that basically can only be done in comics journalism, right? You talked mm-hmm. about the translation that the issue that, you know, the, the idea comes from another medium. Mm-hmm. And so how do you translate what one medium can do into, into another? That's, that seems to be one set of set of problems that comics journalism has. Uh, and, you know, since this book is about, you know, journalism in general, are there, are there other challenges that you see doing the, uh, for doing comics journalism that might be even different from doing prose journalism or video journalism? Sure. I mean, there's different kinds of comics journalism. Um, mm-hmm. There's definitely people who do more kind of explainer type comics journalism. Like I think of Andy Warner, for example, mm-hmm. he does a lot of stuff for the nib and he does great explainers. Mm-hmm. Um, yes. But yes. It's just, it, that's not something that I do a lot of um, because I like you know, I really, with these longer works, I try to focus on the character. Um, but the downside to that is like when it, there is some time when I need to explain things or I want to explain like the history of Kurdish people in Iraq. Um, and then I have to kind of shift modes to explaining things. And like, what I really wish that I could do in that situation is just have a page of text and just like (laughs) not use comics because I'm so afraid of just illustrating text. And I know I did that a lot in my first book. So I was really conscious about that doing the second one. Like, I don't want to illustrate the text. Um, and my husband thought 
I worry about that too much. It's like, sometimes you just have to like, let it go. And like, that's what you're doing. <laughs> um, but you know, I kind of wanted to avoid that. And so those are times when I think like, oh, like if you're working in prose, you can just describe things. You can just, you know, give a history, jump back and forth in time. And you can fit a lot of information into a very short uh, amount of space. Whereas in comics, like, you know, I can't tell you the entire history of these people in one page. <laughs> and maybe that's for the best. Like, I kind of, if left to my own devices, will just like go on and on and like, this book could have been 900 pages. Um, but I think it's, it's kind of good for me to have the constraints of working, you know, in comics and having to like really choose your words carefully and not go too far into the weeds because, you know, in the end of this comic, this book was not about the history of Iraqi Kurds. Um, you have to kind of keep it short. Right. And, you know, you, you mentioned that you don't see yourself as a comics journalist as, as so much of an explainer. And you mentioned Andy Warner as an example, and that's a great one. Um, you know, someone that I thought about as I was reading about this in and, and a book that I um, thought of almost immediately is uh, Jessica Abel's Out on the Wire that came out last year because she's dealing – she's talking about journalism, right, like mm -hmm. public radio journalism. But the big difference between what you're doing and what she did on Out on the Wire is she's much more of an explainer. And, yeah, you do get to see the personality of Jessica Abel, especially at the very beginning. But after that, that personality recedes. But in Rolling mm -hmm. Blackouts, you're aware of Sarah Glidden, the person telling the story, trying to understand what journalism is from beginning to end. Uh, and, I, and I think it's that – it gets back to that earlier point that we were discussing, right? The, the memoir leakage, if you want to put it that way, or the blending mm -hmm. of, of uh, the, the journalistic impulse here where you do contextualize the teller of this journalistic tale. Yeah, you know, I kind of see myself as – you know, I'm making these kinds of books for a reader that's kind of like me, you know? Um, who's like a little bit educated, but like is not an expert in these things. And kind of like, I hope that, you know, the reader is curious and wants to know. And like, that's me, like, I'm curious about this stuff. And like, I'm trying to figure it out. Um, and so I kind of keep myself in there because, you know, I kind of hope that I'm a stand in for the reader. Um, and yeah, I guess that's what I'm going for. I hope it works for people who aren't, you know, white Jewish American girls from Newton, Massachusetts, <laughs> but you know, I try my best. Um, I think, I think, I think it does. I mean, it, do, it does a good job of that. You know, in, the, in your previous answer, you mentioned something about how in prose journalism, something you could do might be easier, like explain it, stopping and explaining the history. But one of the things I was struck with throughout reading rolling blackouts is how many how many uh, unique maybe experimental strategies that you use that um, that could only be done in comics um, and you know I mentioned the, the the translation word balloons but uh, I'm, I was also when you were describing the the stopping and having to explain something the scene where um, you flash back to you and the other Sarah protesting. Um, the onset of the war in Iraq and yet and this this is what's great about doing an audio podcast about a visual medium mm -hmm. <laughs> trying yeah. to describe the stuff that the the word balloons are basically taking place in the narrative present but we're seeing the events from the past is that is yeah. that yeah so. i don't do a ton of that in this book i did a lot of it in how to understand israel yeah. um and i kind of wanted this book felt well, it's not like Israel is fanciful, but this book <laughs> felt like it was, well, because it was much less about me and my imagining of things. So like, it was much less kind of like using comics to show someone's imagination, but yeah, I guess it is. Yeah. I do use it in a couple of places, um, that it just seemed to make sense. And I guess the only places where I use that device in this new book are when two people are talking to each other about a past that they shared. Yeah. Yeah. So Sarah and Dan are, I, I kind of use that when Sarah and Dan are talking about their kind of tween agehood together. There's kind of a little flashback to them, but um, because they were both there, 
And so in that scene that you brought up, Sarah and I were both there. Um, so yeah, I do use that. And, and it's interesting that you say that you're using it less in rolling blackouts, that kind of strategy, uh, than you did in, in How to Understand Israel, because I noticed it much more in rolling blackouts. And, and I think for this reason, um, what you're doing in the new book is your again, by kind of blending these impulses, right? I mean, there's some memoir in here, there's journalism uh, at the same time. There are more narrating levels going on than what we had in the earlier book, right? So you're reporting what's happening around you, uh, and and we see that in the action that's playing out in the panels. But it, you know, in in many of uh, those instances, we have your thoughts and your take on what's going on that tells us something about, I guess, the more memoirist side of you, why you're doing what you're doing, what you're trying to get out of this, what you're attempting to understand. Uh, and then there are other levels uh, as well. For instance, you know, the flashbacks, you know, the, the going back. And then the narrating or the translating, if you will, of someone else's speech. So just in terms of revealing information, I saw this as a much more complex uh, book. I, I, you know, some may make, say that it makes it more literary. I, I think it just adds to the narrativity, right? Because it emphasizes this whole idea of who's telling the story, what's being told, and what's the context of the teller. Yeah, I agree with that. I mean, do you want me to comment on that? Um, <laughs> no, I guess that was I, more of an observation. That's a very, yeah. that's a very good observation. <laughs> okay. Sometimes when we're making these things, we don't think as much about what it means. You know, you're just trying to. You're making the book, and yeah, you're. I'm definitely like thinking about storytelling and what the storytelling is, and you know how that functions in regards to memory. Um, so yeah, that's what this book was about. And so that is something that I wanted to emphasize a lot. Like, I don't know, you know, my next book, I don't see it as being kind of this meta, um, meta journalism project. It's going to be more straightforward. So how am I going to, um, do the next book? Am I going to include myself as much? Like, you know, what kind of, like how much emphasis on the actual interview or like what's going on in the present moment am I going to have? I don't really know. Um, but for this book, because it is about interviewing and journalism and all of these things, yeah, this is the way that I set it up with all of these different layers. Now, when I guess in the early days of this project, uh, you you kickstarted it or at least some aspect of it to, to help defray the cost of, of travel and, and those kind of expenses. Mm -hmm. And, uh, the, the, the working title of the, t of, at the time was what, Stumbling Toward Damascus? Yeah, I didn't know what the title was going to be. <laughs> so, so I'm wondering what happened between, let's say, that preliminary title and the one that we have now, Rolling Blackouts, which those who read the book will, will definitely get the reference. Yeah. Well, you know, Stumbling Towards Damascus, I, kind of came up with that title before we even left. Um, and so how could I have known anything about what the book was really going to be about? Mm. But all I knew was that we were all like trying to get to Damascus. And at that time when I was doing the Kickstarter, we weren't even sure whether the journalists were going to get their journalist visas to go to Syria. Uh, we didn't know like where we were going to be going in Iraq. There was a lot up in the air. Like they weren't able to get the same kinds of grants and funding that they usually get for these kinds of reporting projects. Um, our funding was completely separate. So my expenses, you know, completely separate from the globalist expenses, but all of us together were kind of like, didn't know what we we're doing. So, you know, it's kind of like, I think how many people have used that Yates poem um, <laughs> yeah. for book titles and stuff. And it's, you know, it's one of my favorite poems. And I just kind of like grabbed something from there because it like, I don't know, it sounded good at the time, but I knew that I probably wasn't going to be keeping that. <laughs> um, and it's kind of, it's, you know, it's pretentious and silly at the same time. So definitely that's out. Um, yeah. What's the Joan Didion one? Uh, slouching towards Bethlehem or I think, or slouching short. I don't know. Slouching towards Bethlehem is the original quote. So yeah. I, I don't know if she does that I anyway. I'll, I'll, now, now I got to Google it, but, yeah. um, <laughs> uh, now, Good. yeah, one of the, um, you know, that, that gets to one of the things you get around to at the end too, is the, um, you know, that this, 
you're you know you're 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 doing the the journalism um uh, as it happens recording people and so on but you know for a, a book like this especially a 300 book page book it takes a long time mm-hmm. to to produce it and so the events that you're recording here are what what 5 years ago yeah 6 years yeah. ago yeah so um how does how does that kind of the the time it takes to create a comic in the first place factor into you know some of the decisions you make maybe even about subject matter or about you know the content well the subject matter you know being journalism you know i kind of had a feeling that there wasn't going to be some kind of new uh great boom in journalism where <laughs> journalists would suddenly be like well funded and all this stuff or where it would change completely you know journalism is kind of going to stay the same like even through their like you know changes and flux and innovation um and so yeah the point of the book in at the beginning was just to be about how journalism works and so i hoped that that would still be interesting to people no matter what the subject when it comes to what we ended up talking a lot about which is the iraq war um iraqi refugees you know that is still important and those things you know sadly haven't really changed like the iraqis that we met who were living in damascus cuz damascus was one of like the two major um centers for iraqi refugees it was there and jordan um and you know those what happened to those people still happened to them like them being displaced is still a reality mm-hmm. a lot of them had to go back to iraq which is still really dangerous um, a lot of them kind of moved on with the Syrian refugees that have been leaving Syria. Um, you know, a lot of them had to like turn around and go to Jordan. So their stories are still relevant and still important. And, you know, part of, you know, what our journalists were going into, into this thinking of is that our generation kind of, you know, grew up with the Iraq war. Um, our whole adult lives have been mm-hmm. the Iraq war and the war in Afghanistan and it was really kind of easy for us to kind of move past it once Barack Obama was elected. Um, you kind of just stopped hearing as much about the war in Iraq or about the fallout of what happened. And especially now, I think that's a problem, too, when you have what's going on in Syria kind of overshadowing everything. And it's also tempting for Americans to look at what's happening in Syria as not our problem. You know, mm-hmm. it's, this is a civil war. Oh, Assad is really bad, you know, now Russia's involved, but, you know, let's not fool ourselves like this was, you know, this is part of our problem too. This directly links to the invasion of Iraq um, and we're very involved. So I think that even though like things on the ground have changed, I think it's still important for people to kind of think about the Iraq war and, and what has happened to all these people and what we owe these people that, you know, we kind of uprooted their lives. Yeah, I feel that this is, um, you know, a very timely book, and maybe mm-hmm. on your part, unintentionally so. Although in in the last section, um, home, um, mm-hmm. which takes place in December 2011, a year after you guys took uh, the, the trip, you know, you point out that things at that time, uh, 2011, were getting much more complicated in Syria than when you were there. Mm-hmm. And so it, it's interesting to read that now, knowing what's going on in Syria now, what's been happening since mm-hmm. tw- you know, 2011. So, and, and, I, and I'm wondering if any of the, let's say, marketing or publicity of your book – is in any way uh, trying to put it within the context of the current situation in in uh, Syria? Well, I guess if people know it's a book that takes place in Syria, they're going to be interested. Right. Um, I kind of, you know, when I was working on this, I thought that no one would be interested in a book about mm-hmm. Syria. And when we were reporting there, you know, the p- reporters I was with were worried that no one would be interested in reporting about Syria because it was this kind of, And, you know, it's not easy for journalists to work there. Even before the Civil War happened, you have to get, you know, these special visas. You have a minder looking after you. You have to be checking in with the information ministry. They don't want you going to places where the drought was happening. Um, So you're very constrained when you're reporting in Syria before 2011. Um, And so that's one of the reasons why we didn't hear a lot about Syria. But, yeah, Americans just weren't interested really in Syria. Um, We just knew we had some 
some kind of sanctions on them. We have an embassy or we don't. <laughs> um, but, you know, I, I wish that it was more boring. Like, I don't want, like, I'm not using, like, the conflict in Syria to sell my book. Right. Mm-hmm. The um, only way that this could be more timely is if you had a blurb on the back from, from Gary Johnson, what is Aleppo? Oh, God. <laughs> oh, no. Did you go Why there? didn't Why didn't you reach out to him for a report? Yeah. Um, um, with the, with what, what Derek just asked, too, um, re- led, led to another question I wanted to ask because it looks like you've, you've just, well, uh, aside from, I think, one other, or you're, you're currently involved in a book tour, right? Mm-hmm. For this. Yeah, it's and coming so, out next week. So, yeah. So, what, what has been the reception? I guess you're early on in the book tour. You've got most of it coming up in a couple of weeks, but what has been the response that you've gotten? Oh, it's been good. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> um, you know, Astron and Coralie, what am I supposed to say? It's I been mean, great. Are, but are, yeah. you, are you, I mean, when we're talking about the kind of timeliness, are you, are you noticing an interest in the book be, because of that? It's not like people ask me questions like, because of, like I don't I don't know, mm-hmm. you know, um, and a lot of like the in interviews I've done, people are really interested in talking about journalism mm-hmm. um, and in talking about you know refugee issues because this is about Iraqi refugees, but Iraqi refugees go through the same process when they're actual registered refugees as you know Syrian refugees go through, and there's a lot of the same misconceptions about the refugees back then as there are about refugees now, so you know, would a person interviewing me be more interested in the book now than they would be five years ago? Mm-hmm. Like, I don't know. Mm-hmm. Um, but that's not really my concern. You know, my concern right. was making the book the way that it was supposed to be made. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Now, um, this book, I guess, did it debut at SPX a couple of weeks ago? It debuted. It was kind of like an early debut i guess because it's coming out in on the 4th of october right uh, but they did have early copies there and at the brooklyn book fest yeah and you know you and i met each other briefly there at spx and you you gave me a nice uh, uh signage in my copy of rolling <laughs> blackouts which i appreciate thank you but one thing i did not have the pleasure of seeing is your panel with joe sacco which is all about comics journalism and so i was wondering uh if you could tell us a little bit of how that panel, how have you were able to bring what you're doing in Rolling Blackouts to that SPX panel and then set that within the context of what Joe Sacco does? Uh, hmm. I don't know. I've been like, I, I was very happy to be on panel with Joe Sacco. Like we had never talked about that stuff publicly, but we have like seen each other over the years at different festivals. And I've definitely talked to him about this stuff before. Actually, when I was, just had gotten back from doing this trip. I went to Portland for, uh, was it Stumptown? That festival that was, used to be there. Um, and I very shyly emailed Joe and asked him, like I had never met him, and asked him if I could like maybe ask him some questions about comics journalism. And he said, sure, you know, we're going to be at this bar at this time. And um, it was like amazing. I got to ask him like a whole bunch of stuff about like, how do you do this? And like, how do you like deal with that? And he was very wise because he didn't give me actually any like, you know, this is how you do it. He was more just encouraging of like for me to keep asking the questions that I was asking and to kind of find my own path with this. He's like, if you're thinking about that, if you're worried about X thing, that means you're headed in the right direction. Um, And so that kind of like was a great guide as I was working on this book was just to kind of follow my gut. And if there was something that I was worried about and something that I was like, okay, how am I going to do this? Then it meant that I was, you know, kind of constructing my own path in the right way. Um, Because, you know, there isn't like any guides out there for how to do comics journalism Mm -hmm. the right way. Like Joe has his way of doing it. And, you know, I obviously like have read all his books and like, I love what he does. Um, but I'm not trying to copy him. I'm not trying to do things like exactly the same way that he is. Um, And on that panel, it was great to just kind of talk about this stuff um, and to go off of, you know, questions that Matt Bors, who was moderating had, or people in the audience had. Um, And he's just an interesting guy to talk to. I don't know. I could have talked to him for another hour. Um, Mm -hmm. So yeah, it was a good panel. 
Um, yeah, I don't know. That's interesting that Matt Bors moderated it. Did did he also kind of contribute his own um, his own feelings about comics journalism into it? No, he, I think he was a very good moderator that way. You know, he <laughs> kind good. of like like you know, as your moderator, you need to step back a little bit. Um, right. But he he definitely guided the conversation in a great way, and I think it was awesome that Matt was um, moderating because he really knows about this stuff. Right. You know? right. Like it's his business now. He edits the nib and, you know, he edited my first piece of comics journalism back when he was working at Cartoon Movement. And so it's it was great having someone who really knows what they're talking about and who has kind of worked with all different kinds of comics journalism to be up there um, kind of guiding the conversation. Well, you mentioned the nib and then comics journalism. Let's talk a bit about your piece that came out last month uh, on, and this is the second third party candidate we brought <laughs> yeah. up, uh, and that is your Jill Stein piece. Mm -hmm. Yeah, how, how, did, how did that come about? Uh, Matt asked me to do it. <laughs> he just comes out at the exact right moment. Um, I had kind of was just finishing up work on rolling blackouts. I was, you know, doing the little odds and ends and and papers and kind of things like that and didn't really have anything set to work on yet. I hadn't even had a time, like time to sit and think. And he emailed me and asked me if I'd be interested in doing a magazine style profile on Jill Stein, who I think I had known her name, but I didn't really know who she was. Um, and I'd never done a profile before or any political journalism. And so I was like really excited to have like a little, a challenging assignment um, and so, yeah, it was, it was their idea. Um, and it was really, you know, like very, it was great for them to come up with that then. It was, this was back in like April or May. Cause at that time, Jill Stein wasn't really getting very much media attention. And so we were able to go to her campaign and say like, Hey, can we have a comics journalist follow you around, um, a bunch? And they said, yes. And if we had kind of tried to arrange that in June or something, I think, they would have probably said no. Um, so I got this incredible access. I, you know, I went to two different campaign stops of hers and I also went and interviewed her at her house in Massachusetts. Um, and that was that I did about a month of reporting and then it took about a month to draw it. Um, and it was really interesting to work on. Like I found out a lot about, um, third parties, um, that I didn't know before, which is, yeah, which is the fun thing about doing journalism is that, like, you get to just kind of, like, find out everything you can about something new and and then make something about it. Would you see yourself doing more of this kind of comics, uh, this kind of profile journalism, taking on more projects like this? Sure. Profiles, yes. I don't know if I'm going to do any more campaign journalism <laughs> anytime soon. Um, it's hard to do a profile on a politician. They're you know, they have a message that they need to deliver. And so you really like, you need to kind of find ways to get the human being in there. Um, but yeah, it's, it's great having, you know, a lot of time with the same person and being able to see them in different situations and, you know, have multiple interviews with them is, is really great. Do you feel that, um, um, you know, now with the memoirish, with a little bit of reportage, how to understand Israel, with the rolling blackouts on journalism, and then some of this other work, for instance, the the profile on Jim Stein that you, uh, Jill Stein that you've done, that your your readers will kind of lock you into a particular kind of writing that may make you a little uncomfortable as a creator. No, I mean. You know, I think everything that I've I've done a lot of different stuff. Um, rolling blackouts is really different from how to understand Israel. The Jill Stein piece is different from some of the other like short form comics that I've done. I do some, you know, I do some stuff that's more not just like journalism about a certain person or place, but kind of more about ideas. I did one last year about um, about greetings, about different cultures and how people greet each other like through kisses or hugs. And that was more of a like using my own life um, to kind of look into this more like, you know, kind of idea and like how people uh, communicate with each other. So to me, it's varied if, you know, but I guess I have my own voice too. So everything's going to be connected in that way. 
but I'm not, no, I'm not afraid of being pigeonholed or anything. I think everything's been pretty different except, yeah, I guess the first two books are both about the Middle East. So we'll have to move away from the Middle East for the next one. And one of the reason, reasons why I was asking, and again, I'm drawing a, a, a connection with, um, um, with Joe Sacco is that you know he's primarily known as a comics journalist, but then a couple of years ago when he came out with Bump, you know it now you know he's done this kind of fictional uh, comics writing mm-hmm. before, but the journalism has just overshadowed everything else. So Bump seemed very different within the context of Joe Sacco, the comics journalist, and so I was wondering if you have any interests in. In other kinds of, of writing, maybe maybe more straight out fiction, or even working within certain kind of fictional genres. I thought Bump was also autobiographical. Like, wasn't that about him following around a band? Uh, no, no, no. That was no? that was an earlier work of his, oh, okay. right? Uh, and and even though a character of of Joe Sacco appears in Bump. Um, I definitely wouldn't call it biographical. Okay. Yeah. But um, it, it's just a very different it, – it, it's probably the closest thing to, to finding – or to describing that is it, it, it's very much like the underground comics of the 60s mm-hmm. and 70s. Mm. Yeah, I don't know. I'm not really – I don't really think about doing fiction. Mm-hmm. Um, I tried when I first started getting into comics, um, and it felt I, – I don't know. It just didn't feel right for me. I felt like I was making things up, <laughs> which I was. Um, but like, there's some, I, I love reading fiction and, it, you know, when I read a good comic or a good novel, you know, just that feeling that I don't see that someone made it. I see that this is just like the story that was already there, that this is like real in some way. And when I try to make fiction, it's too, you know, I am too aware of the fact that I'm making it. And it feels like, um, I don't know, like it feels false to me. So it's not something that I can do. I admire the hell out of people who can write fiction. I think it's amazing. Um, but it's not really something that I'm interested in. Okay. There's too much interesting stuff to write about. <laughs> well, what about the decision to publish this new edition of How to Understand Israel? Um, was it that you know, you were wanting to do this through Drawn and Quarterly anyway and to time this around uh, Rolling Blackout? Uh, they came – I mean that was kind of their idea. Mm-hmm. Um, Drawn and Quarterly wanted to pick it up. You know, Vertigo had had it in print for a long time. Um, but, you know, they've been going through a lot of changes and I think they were moving to – moving all of the D.C. offices to L.A. So there was a lot of like turmoil and like I don't know if – they would have kept it in print much longer than that. So I think John and quarterly just thought, okay, let's take this, you know, it's still being used in classes and things like that. And so, um, but it wasn't really, like, I'd like, I didn't really have much to do with, you know, planning on when it came out or any of that. Um, but I'm glad that they took it over. You know, like there was a secret part of me when I was first doing the mini comics for that book, um, that was like, what if John and Quarterly published my book? <laughs> um, but I kind of knew like that wasn't going to happen because at the time, like I was just so green and, um, and then, you know, instead Vertigo came along and did it. Mm-hmm. Um, but that was totally unexpected. But yeah, I think John and Quarterly, and, you know, it sounds like I'm just saying this because they're my publisher now and I'm kissing up, but they always <laughs> like, since I first got into like, you know, indie comics, I'll t- Drawn and Quarterly was kind of like my favorite publisher and the one that I always kind of dreamed of of working with. And so, you know, I'm really happy that they have both of my books now. Mm. Well, how did that relationship with Vertigo first come about? Uh, randomly, I was selling my mini comics at Mocha with a whole bunch of other Brooklyn cartoonists. And everyone else went out to lunch and I was manning the table. And John Benkin, who turned out to be my editor, he just came over to the table. He looked at a bunch of the books um, he picked up mine, asked me what it was about, and then, you know, I told him, and I, his badge said DC Comics, so I didn't, I wasn't really nervous, but I was like, this guy doesn't care about my comics, um, but then he bought them, and I didn't really think anything of it, because, you know, they do Batman, 
So <laughs> a few days later, he emailed me and he said he liked the mini comics and that Vertigo wanted to make it into a book. They were at the time trying this new line of original graphic novels, um, like creator written and drawn. So I was part of that little experiment and it didn't last very long, but I, <laughs> I got a great opportunity out of it. Um, and you know, I will be forever grateful to, to Vertigo for giving me a chance. Cause I had only been making comics for a couple of years at that point. Um, so it was a huge deal for me. Now, were, were you a part of the, the pizza Island studio at that time? That, no, is that that's, what the Mocha that was group way was? before. Oh, okay. And well, a couple of years before pizza Island. Okay. Mm -hmm. But so uh, pizza, Pizza Island then overlaps with the beginning of of uh, Rolling Blackouts, right? Yeah, a little bit. So yeah. when I got back from the trip to Rolling Blackouts, uh, Matt Boers asked me to do a comic about Iraqi refugees in Syria. Um, <laughs> he knew that I had been doing that. So, yeah, that's like kind of like the last big thing that I did at Pizza Island before um, we kind of disbanded. And then I went, I went to Angoulême for the the residency there. Mm. And yeah, I miss pizza Island. It was wonderful. Like, I don't know if I'll ever find a shared studio that had yeah. just that, like, you know, we just all fit together so well. Everyone was doing something a little bit different. So it didn't feel competitive, but everybody was really, you know, every, everyone was doing really great stuff. So we were all like really motivated by each other. I miss those girls. So it was, it was you and, um, me and, Julia Wirtz, Lisa yeah. Hannawalt, Domitil Collardy, Meredith Grant, and Kate Beaton. Okay. And now I think only Meredith is left in New York. Everybody else is gone. Mm. And you got a good number of drawn and quarterly creators. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's true. Yeah. And three three Pete's Islanders won Ignatz's at SPX a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. So Meredith, uh, Kate, and and Lisa. So I think yeah. we we got it we got it going pretty good over there. <laughs> Pizza <laughs> Island. Yeah, 2016 is a good year for mm -hmm. for Pizza Islanders. Yeah, yeah. Now you know when you started Rolling Blackouts, or at least when you were kickstarting this, um, you had finished How to Understand Israel in 60 Days or Less, but it hadn't yet been released. So you know, you you what became Rolling Blackouts was incubating when we you know still hadn't seen at least in book form how to understand israel um what may be incubating right now that you can share with us um let's see nothing i want to share too specifically about but i am you know working on rolling blackouts did really you know i've just been thinking and reading and working with uh refugee issues and immigration um for 5 years and so it's something that i'm really I think is important and I think, you know, is important closer to home, not just refugees waiting on the other right. side of the world. So I really kind of, I want to work more with, um, with those issues and like just migration and movement in general. Sounds interesting, right? Yes, it does. <laughs> <laughs> I hope so. You've whetted um, our curiosity. Yeah. Well, you know, I think just reading, reading rolling blackouts now with, you know, with all the talk about your immigration, especially Syrian refugees, and and for example, the the detailed process that you you demonstrate for um, how Sam, for example, made his way to the United States, and then what happened to him mm -hmm. in the U.S. I think is not only is that an interesting story in and of itself, but I think it it, it illuminates some of the it gives some information that I think is missing from some of the debates about immigration that are going on right now. Like what does it take to be declared a refugee and, um, you know, how long does it take to get in and so on? Yeah. It makes my blood boil. I got to say like over the past couple of years, you know, as this has been an issue that's kind of in the public eye a lot more hearing the kind of thing that people say about refugees, like they're not vetted. We don't know who they are. You know, it's just like, they are vetted so much. They have to go through almost two years of interviews and waiting. And, you know, they, we don't accept single m young men, for example, like Trump is talking about like all these young terrorists, like we kind of almost only accept like women and families. Um, they go through such like 
a complicated process to get here. And then once they do get here, it's not like they have this free ride. They have to play, pay back their plane ticket costs. Mm. They have to get a job. And within like three months, you know, they don't get, and like a lot of the groups that are doing all the work are these like, you know, church and temple and, and mosque groups that are like kind of responsible for getting these people settled. Um, so it's really hard <laughs> It's hard being a refugee even after you've left, you know, the conflict zone. And it bothers me a lot how much misinformation there is about that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you're you're referring to here in the U.S., but this is something mm-hmm. that comes out very clearly in rolling blackouts as well, that, you know, even when refugees are able to find at least, you know, relatively speaking, some kind of safe haven, um, it's it's still not easy for them, uh, you know, no. both in terms of the logistics of their situation, but also psychologically. And I think this this really comes home in the figure of Sam that mm-hmm. both Sarah, the journalist, your friend, and Alex work with, uh, because his story, along with Dan's, and we haven't even talked about Dan yet, which is mm-hmm. interesting. Um, I mean, these are the two st- stories in Rolling Blackouts that are the most sustained. What's going mm-hmm. on with these characters? So um, now <laughs> with – uh, and, and that was the observation part. Now, my question part is um, w- with Sam. I mean, Sam seems to be you know definitely baked into what's going on here in you reporting about the journalism. Um, mm-hmm. Dan, and you know, of course, I do not doubt his existence. But of all the <laughs> elements of rolling blackouts, his, his presence seems the most literary, if that makes sense. And I'm wondering hmm. if not not that you fictionalized it in any way but as you were writing rolling blackouts did you think that there was something about the character of dan that made rolling blackouts something almost novelistic uh it was definitely interesting that he was there at first i was really annoyed that he was there like i thought he was screwing up my story which you know had been a very simple concept that i was going to follow my journalist friends around and then just write about them and what they were doing. Um, and then only later to, you know, I realized that his relationship with Sarah, um, was kind of forming one of like the, the cores of the book. Um, you know, I don't know if I thought of it like that, like, Oh, he's very literary. Great that he's here. Um, but it was like very present in, you know, in the group and like that, the tension between those two friends and, you know, the kind of discussions and arguments that they had um, were, you know, very much like they kind of were a lot of our focus a lot of the time. Um, And so, yeah, I'm really, I'm glad that 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 became part of the book Um, because I thought it was going to be a distraction from the more important, you know, quote unquote, important stories of, these people who are displaced and like deported and all of this stuff. And, you know, if you look at them side by side, like, yeah, it, those things seem like, you know, it's not a contest, but those things seem like much more important in like the way we look at those stories. But I think that Dan and Sarah and how they talk about the war is really important because it's kind of like, this is, you know, this is my generation talking about, this very present conflict that, you know, really informs a lot of our lives and kind of what does that mean? And how are we going to like, you know, address the war and our part in it? And what are we going to do about it now that we're in our thirties and we're the ones who are kind of like in, you know, slowly taking over control of the country. So I think that it's great that he's there, that he allowed those conversations to happen because I do think that they're important. That that is one of the more interesting things that comes out of this book too is the, your generation, your, you know how you you talk about your generation and the uh, how um, the other Sarah, for example, mentions the feeling of guilt about maybe not pushing the protests farther mm-hmm. in, in that in order to make it more difficult at least for the war in Iraq to take place or to prevent it even through those protests. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> but it also makes me think as, you know, as, as a generation Xer then, is there something that I'm, you know, that I could have done back then too, you know? 
Yeah, maybe. I mean, I think back to like the nineties, I was a teenager in the nineties and I just did not know anything about what was going on with world politics. You know, the way that the economy was and like the Clinton years, it was like, you didn't really have to know what was going on, even though like we were so like, you know, the American government was so involved with so many parts of the world. Um, but those things didn't touch us. They we didn't have like a very active war that we could see and that, you know, so I really was like, you know, my teenage years were just kind of like worrying about my friends and did this guy like me and all this stuff. And I look <laughs> at like, I look at teenagers now or teen, you know, the millennials that everyone's talking about, like who are teenagers during this whole war and like how aware they are of what's going on in the world and what's going on in the United States. And like, they're just so much smarter and more engaged um, than well, at least I was. There's probably other people my age that were engaged, but I think it's like a completely different time. And I think a lot of people in my generation, like, yeah, just like weren't really paying attention. And for me, I know um, 9-11 was a wake up call kind of. It was like, oh, there's a world out there and we've, you know, we've interfered with it. What is going on? Um, and that was kind of the moment that I started paying attention to journalism and paying attention to the rest of the world. Because I think like it was really easy in the U.S. to kind of like ignore the problems without, you know, outside of the country and also to ignore the problems within the country. Um, it was just kind of like if you're a white American in like the middle class or upper class, like things were pretty good and you didn't really have to pay attention. Um, and that's totally different now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The, what, what you just said made me think about something I've been thinking about a lot lately as a teacher that um, teaching, you know, college freshmen that were probably two years out. Yeah, we, I mean, we are two years out from having students who weren't born. You know, yeah. <laughs> During that time, yeah, that's or we're born after nine eleven, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. you know, and now are are we're two years old, so they have no they have no consciousness of uh, you know other than history classes or whatever of a world outside mm -hmm. of these you know seemingly internal eternal conflicts in the world being you know the way it is as even just described in, in rolling blackouts. That's mm -hmm. been yeah. the way of the the world for their lives. Mm hmm. Yeah, and then I also worry about being a Generation Xer and not, you know, not repeating what uh, the baby boomers did and ruining the world and continuing. <laughs> well, to ruin the world. but <laughs> we're all ruining the world. You know? <laughs> I guess, like, you just kind of accept have to accept that if you want to like do anything good. Um, but yeah, it's too late. Too late. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, Andy, it's funny that you consider yourself a Generation Xer. I, I never have, and I know I'm a little older, but I'm not a baby boomer. I, I, I don't know what the hell I am. I, it's just, you know, stuck there right there in the middle. But I guess what, for, for many people, what the the Iraq War, the second one, uh, conflict, was for them, it would have to be the, I guess, the heating up of the Cold War again during the Reagan years. Uh, th that's what it was for me in, in terms of the protest and the awareness and it really forming a big part of my adult core. What would become my adult core? Hmm. Mm -hmm. And now you have younger people who didn't really, I mean, even my like, people, my age, I'm 36. Like we don't really have any like conscious memory of the cold war. And so like, we think it's kind of stupid, <laughs> like, <laughs> you know, <laughs> we think that all like the red hair stuff and like so i think it, it is an it's a really, really interesting time that like you know yeah you have like a shifting of a cultural memory um political memory into something new and i think it's it's much better even though the world seems like it's going to hell like i think it's a much better time and it's kind of a really hopeful time because people are kind of paying more attention and um that's a good thing mm -hmm. i hope so Ugh. Yeah, don't worry. We got, got this, and if if we don't got this, then like the younger people do. Like I think they're really, 
they uh, they're much smarter than us. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> and you know, with with what we're saying now, um, and, and the tone I think that has has come into our conversation. And again, I don't want to give anything away about what happens at the, exactly what happens at the very end of rolling blackouts. But I think there's a similar um, mood and similar tone at the end of rolling blackouts in that you begin by asking the question, "What is journalism?" And then that last section, home, uh, you revisit this question. Um, again, directly in that last part, but you don't come to any easy resolution. And in fact, it, it ends ambiguously in a way that does provide, let's say, a mixture of uncertainty and possible hope, which, uh, which, which I appreciated. Yeah, that's kind of my thing. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have answers. Um, yeah, hmm. it's kind of a downer of an ending, but I don't know. I like downers. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I try to teach my students that um, what, what I, I don't teach anything that has a happy ending in it because I tell them that, that they're, they're not entitled to happy endings. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they expect there's too much. There's too many happy endings that they can get in their in the in the pop culture that they receive. Right. So you probably never have taught um, color purple. No, I know. I teach, I teach the road almost every semester. <laughs> <laughs> wow, on that up. up <laughs> um, well, Sarah, so you you're getting ready to head off on a book tour, and how long will that last? Oh, about a month. Yeah, or a couple weeks. I don't know. There's like two weeks of like constant travel, and then I'm going to be doing a bunch of things after that. But I at least get to come home for a little while. So. So more yeah. traveling for you. Yeah. Yeah. Well, good luck on that book tour. And again, thank you. thank you very much for taking the time and talking with us. Oh, thanks for talking to me. Thanks. Well, that was fun. Um, I, I uh, really enjoyed meeting Sarah at SPX a couple of weeks ago, but unfortunately, um, you know, she was busy during that entire time that she was there, and she was only there on Saturday, uh, not on Sunday. So I'm glad that we were able to work out this interview for the podcast because I think we had a nice, detailed, leisurely conversation. Yeah, I like I like that we were able to kind of. Uh, you know, talk about the broader implications of this this book in terms of her analysis of journalism, but also uh, take a deeper dive into some of the you know stylistic choices that she made. Right. Yeah, it's definitely something that all of you listening to this show should pick up. It's rolling blackouts, dispatches from Turkey, Syria, and Iraq from Drawn in Quarterly. But you know, you can get her first book or the reprint of her first book, How to Understand Israel in 60 Days or Less, at the website of our sponsor, which is Discount Comic Book Service. So if you go to dcbservice.com right now, you will be able to find either the hardbound or the paperback version of How to Understand Israel at great discounts. You can't go wrong with dcbservice.com. And after you do get your books there, get in touch with us and let us know what you thought about our interview with Sarah Glidden. If you go to our website, comicsalternative.com, you'll find that you can leave us a voice message through the wonders of SpeakPipe, which is really easy to use. Or if you want to be a little more difficult about things, then pick up the phone and call us the old-fashioned way. Our phone number is 4153-COMICS. That's 4153266427. That's right. Uh, or you can get a hold of us by email. We are two guys at comicsalternative.com. And you can also get a hold of us individually. I'm Andy at comicsalternative.com. And I'm Derek at comicsalternative.com. And you can also check out our Twitter feed at the number two guys with PhDs. That's right. But you know, you can find us all over social media, such as 
Facebook, Tumblr, Instagram, Google+, Goodreads, Pinterest, and YouTube. You can subscribe to the podcast through iTunes. You can stream us on Stitcher. You can find us on TuneIn, on Spotify, and on iHeartRadio. And if you're an Android user, on Google Play Music. But you know, you can find every single one of our podcast episodes, as well as the reviews and the comics-related commentary that we post on our blog, simply by going to our website, which is comicsalternative.com. That's right. Always the get a hold of us and let us know how we're doing. That's right. And we do like to hear from you. And we have several more interviews lined up in the near future. So listen up for those. Until then, I'm Derek. I'm Andy. See ya.